scattered from the eastern coast of Greece across the Aegean Sea to Asia Minor are scores of beautiful islands. Upon the map they seem like stepping stones for the giants of old to pass dry shod from shore to shore. The mainland of Greece, even in her most prosperous days, was always small. Her families were large, and the few fruitful valleys deep among the barren hills have never yielded more than a scant supply of food. So the Greeks have always been a roving people, seeking new homes wherever they might better their conditions. In the early days, the beautiful islands of the Aegean, so near to their shores, were their favorite settling places. There they built cities established island kingdoms and waged wars. In times of peace, they sent their merchant fleets throughout the world. They cultivated the arts and literature, and the cities of the island kingdoms were scarcely less brilliant than was Athens in her brightest days. The most easterly of the Aegean islands is Rhodes, lying 12 miles from the Asia Minor shore just where Cape Alipo juts into the sea. It is the largest of the Sporades group, yet its length from northeast to southwest is but 45 miles. Its width is half its length. Its area of 424 square miles is less than half the size of our own little Rhode Island. A mountain range, Atayero, the Atabaris of the ancients, whose highest peaks reach 4,560 feet above the sea, runs lengthwise through the island, and from their summits, Crete is visible on the southern horizon. From the central range, spurs reach out in every direction, as if there were arms bathing in the sea. Thus along the coast, large, beautiful, amphitheater-like harbors are formed. The mountainsides were once clothed with forests of mighty trees, but their Turkish owners have cut them down for making charcoal. Figs, oranges, pomegranates, and grapes, favored by the gentle climate, have always grown there abundantly. History has not yet told us the name of the first people who lived upon the island, or when or whence they came. Yet we know that Rhodes was inhabited centuries before Homer sang of Troy. Tradition says that the Telkines, renowned for their skill as metal workers, were the first to settle there. The earliest Rhodian inhabitants of whom history speaks were the Greek colonists from Argos. There they built the cities, they sailed their ships on all the seas, their prosperity attracted others from the mainland until the little island could support no more. And in their turn, they sent out colonists to settle in Asia Minor, in Italy, and even in distant Spain. At the extreme northeastern end of the island, is a large harbor embraced by two of the arms projecting from the mountains. There, small bands of colonists had built their homes, but it was not till 408 BC that the harbor was selected as the site of the city of Rhodes. Hippodamus, an architect of Miletus, was selected to lay out its plan, and the new capital of the thriving little kingdom soon rivaled the older cities of Greece. Its streets were straight and wide. Its lofty walls were strong enough to resist the most powerful armies. To the sun god Helios, or Apollo, the deity of the island, a magnificent temple was erected, and in the public squares stood fully a hundred colossal statues of gods and of men. A long pier was built, forming two harbors where there had been one before. At the entrance to the smaller harbor to the east, rocks were heaped up so that but a single ship might enter at a time. But the larger harbor to the west could accommodate her many merchant fleets. To increase the population of the new city, the inhabitants of Lindus, Lalesis, and Camarus, and other towns of the island were brought there, and the fame of Rhodes aroused the covetousness of her neighbors. 
its independence was brief. Successively, it became subject to Sparta, and to Athens, and to Artemisia of Halicarnassus, who built the wonderful tomb to her husband Mausolus. In 340 BC, it was captured by the Persians. Eight years later, it fell into the hands of Alexander the Great. But when Alexander died, it recovered its freedom. Again at peace, Rhodes prospered. Once more, its merchant ships covered the seas. Alexandria at the time was the great market where the grains of India and Africa were stored. But it was in Rhodian ships that they were distributed throughout the world. Thus was formed a strong bond between the little island and the great Egyptian city. When Alexander died, Antigonus, one of his generals, became king of Macedonia. A quarrel arose between Macedonia and King Ptolemy of Egypt, and Antigonus, with his son Demetrius, made war upon the Egyptian king. Then the commerce and the prosperity of little Rhodes were threatened for if Alexandria fell, there would be no grain for the Rhodian ships to carry. Rhodes, therefore, sent its fleet to the aid of Ptolemy, and the Macedonians were driven home. Though little Rhodes saved its shipping, Demetrius, determined that it should be punished for causing his defeat, laid siege to the city. It was a fierce war. The historians of the time say that the Macedonians anchored before the city with 370 ships and with 40,000 men on board. Among the strange instruments of war which they brought was a helopolis, or a wooden tower nine stories high, so heavy that 3,400 men were required to move it. There was consternation in Rhodes, for its 7,000 citizens and foreigners were too few to resist the enemy. The slaves were armed and were promised liberty if victory should be won. If slain, they were promised a public funeral, their daughters a dowry, and their sons an education at the expense of the state. It was a struggle for existence. The rich gave their wealth, the women cut off their hair for bowstrings. With his mighty engines, Demetrius made breaches in the wall. Once he broke into the city, but he was quickly repelled. Then the Rhodians tore down their temples and theaters to obtain material for an inner wall about the city. At length, their old friend Ptolemy came to their aid, and for this he was honored with the name Savior or Soter. It was still a hard fight of twelve months, when finally the Rhodians succeeded in burning the wooden parts of the engines of war. Demetrius discouraged, abandoned the siege, and sailed away, leaving behind him all that was left of the great engines of war. It was from the metal of these engines, or with the proceeds, thirty talents, derived from its sale, that the Colossus of Rhodes was built. Again, Rhodes was at peace. Demetrius had been driven away, the city was saved, the Rhodian ships again carried the grain of Alexandria, prosperity returned, the people were happy. Among the citizens was Chares, a sculptor of Lindus, and a pupil of the renowned Lysippus, who had beautified the city with the colossal statues of the deities. Among his many works, which had won the admiration of all the world, was a chariot of the sun god, standing twenty feet in height. Why should not a monument be erected to commemorate the victory over Demetrius? Money was at hand, and for what better purpose could be used the thirty talents derived from the sale of the instruments of war abandoned by Demetrius? Who but Chares, who had already adorned the city with statues, was worthy of building one mightier than all the others? one to cause all the world to wonder. To whom but Helios, the protecting god of the city, should the statue be dedicated? Where should the statue stand but on the mole in the harbor where the fleet of the vanquished Demetrius had been anchored? Chares accepted the commission, and so there came into existence the Colossus of Rhodes, the sixth of the seven wonders of the world. 
the ancient authors have told us little of this great work of cherries but his work was a herculean task for twelve long years he labored and at last in the year two eighty b c his task was completed section by section the brass had been cast in molds and was ready to be raised on its foundation in the harbor it is only a medieval tradition which claims that the statue stood astride the entrance to the harbor and that the tallest ships might pass between its legs the ancients make no mention of so undignified a position as the monstrous brass legs were erected the great hollows within were filled with stone masonry lest the body become top-heavy and fall over thus the statue grew upward there is a tradition but whether it is true or not we may never know that chares himself never completed the statue for when fitting its parts together he discovered an error in his measurements and with chagrin he committed suicide leaving the completion of the work to another the height of the colossus is generally given as seventy cubits or about one hundred and five feet the statue of liberty in new york harbor stands one hundred and fifty one feet above its stone pedestal within was a spiral stairway leading to the head where if medieval tradition be true was a beacon light to guide the ships to the city no authoritative picture of the statue has survived and so meager are the ancient descriptions that every attempt to restore it would be in vain we only know that it was of brass and so immense in size and so beautiful in workmanship that it won the admiration of the world the colossus of rhodes was not destined to stand long earthquakes are frequent in that part of the world and in the year 224 b c fifty-six years after the statue was erected the island was violently shaken probably the stone masonry of its foundation was not sufficiently strong to withstand the shock it cracked the statue swayed back and forth and fell with a crash in the fall the sections were wrenched apart and upon the rocks the colossus lay like a huge dismembered giant the fame of the statue had spread to all lands and the report of its destruction caused general regret at once it was proposed to restore it from the cities throughout greece and from egypt and even from the hostile macedonians came offers of assistance the oracle at delphi was consulted to learn the will of the gods but the oracular response perhaps controlled by some rival interest forbade its restoration the city of rhodes too suffered severely from the earthquake its shipping declined its prosperity departed and the great statue was left to lie unmolested on the rocks three centuries later when pliny visited the island the brass giant was still prostrate wondering at its size he wrote most worthy of admiration is the colossal statue of the sun which stood formerly at rhodes and was the work of chares the lindian no less than seventy cubits in height the statue fifty-six years after it was erected was thrown down by an earthquake but even as it lies it excites our wonder and imagination few men can clasp the thumb in their arms and the fingers are larger than most statues where the limbs are broken asunder vast caverns are seen yawning in the interior within too are to be seen large masses of rocks by the aid of which the artist steadied it while erecting it efforts were made to restore the prosperity of rhodes but the city continued to decline in the year forty three b c the roman cassius plundered it because the Rhodians would not pay him the 45,000 talents he demanded. The next year it became a part of the Roman Empire, and its ships were burned. In 155 AD, an earthquake completely destroyed the city. In 653, the Arabs, whose power had been rapidly spreading toward the west, took possession of the island. There upon the rocks the Colossus still lay, 
it was in the year 672 that the arab conquerors under the caliph mawia sold the fallen statue to a jew of homs as old metal tradition says that the jew loaded the brass onto 900 camels and carrying it to lorima sold it to the sword makers one author Estimating the weight of a camel load at 800 pounds, asserts that the brass of the statue weighed 360 tons. In time, the Venetians, and later the Italians, took the island. In 1309, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem captured it and rebuilt the city, but every trace of the statue had long since disappeared. Even the place where it stood was forgotten. Again the city flourished. Twelve years before Columbus sailed toward America, Mohammed II, the Turk, failed in his attempt to take the island. In 1522, the Sultan Suleiman besieged it with 200,000 men, and 80,000 of them fell before the knights surrendered and were expelled. Since then, Rhodes has remained in Muslim hands. The city still exists, but the entire population of the island numbers but 30,000. Perhaps among its 2,000 Jews are descendants of the Jew of Homs, who brought the metal of the famous statue and sold it to be converted into instruments of war. Should you visit Rhodes today, you would find an abundance of traces of the Knights of St. John. There stand their city walls, and perhaps some of their houses, in the one long street of the modern city. The ruins of the amphitheater of the early days still exist, and fallen marble columns mark the site of the ancient Senate House. The peasant, tilling the fields about the city, now and then uncovers the pedestals of ancient statues and wonders what they were. You may visit the old rock mole and the little harbor now filled with sand, but you will look in vain for the place where the famous Colossus stood. <laughs>